As we face the threat of bioterrorism, can we depend on new vaccines? We dropped our guard on smallpox, so we are vulnerable. Directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. The war on terrorism has brought some new realities to all of us. One of them is the possibility of biological attack. Terrorists might well try to release lethal germs, viruses, and bacteria in densely populated areas that would wreak havoc, a frightening scenario. There is protection against many of these powerful agents in the form of vaccines. The problem is availability and safety. This is what everyone is afraid of, smallpox virus a tiny microbe with a killer punch. After a 12-day incubation period, victims develop high fever, nausea, aches, and a widespread pus-filled rash. Up to 40% of patients die. Survivors are scarred for life. Some are left blind. The good news is there's a smallpox vaccine that protects anyone who is vaccinated with it. The word vaccination comes from the Latin word vaca for cow. No. Vaccination originally meant vaccination against smallpox. In 1796, an English doctor, Edward Jenner, discovered that milkmaids infected with cowpox were immune to smallpox. The first vaccine against smallpox was pus taken from an active cowpox sore and spread on punctures on the skin. It conveyed immunity to smallpox. On October 26, 1977, the World Health Organization declared the world free of smallpox, and the vaccine slowly fell out of use. The eradication of smallpox is considered the greatest triumph of public health, but today we are vulnerable because we have a population largely unprotected if there were to be a biological attack with smallpox. The U.S. has 77 million doses of the old tried and true cow-based vaccine, but the 209 million new doses of fresh vaccine being prepared now haven't been tested in large clinical trials, and health officials, quite frankly, are worried about serious side effects. Even the old time-tested vaccine produced side effects in one out of every 10,000 vaccinations. The lesson here is that we dropped our guard on smallpox. Even when a disease appears to be reduced or eliminated, we have to have vaccines. It could come back. That's the bottom line. That's the message. And we're right behind now and have to move much more quickly against not only smallpox, but a lot of other unusual infections, like anthrax, that we never thought we would need vaccines for. At least there are vaccines for smallpox and anthrax. For some diseases, vaccines don't exist. Researchers at the Harvard School of Public Health must work in a containment laboratory to study highly infectious diseases. Tuberculosis bacteria, or TB, is one of these diseases. It is considered a re-emerging infectious disease. There are 8 million new TB cases in the world each year, and each year 3 million people die. Of the three biggest infectious killers in the world, malaria, AIDS, and TB, TB is perhaps the most contagious. One third of all AIDS deaths in Africa occur from TB. The bacteria takes advantage of a compromised immune system. There is presently no vaccine for either malaria or AIDS or TB. TB is perhaps the most formidable microbe next to HIV that we know about. It's a bug that if it sits on the pavement because someone spat, it can stay there for days and float in the environment. It's a very, very tough bug. This is a tuberculosis bacterium. It lives inside cells. Once it gets into cells, it's very hard to stop. To make things worse, TB, HIV, and malaria are most prevalent in poor third world countries where there's no profitable market to pay for vaccine development. It may depend on wealthier countries to invest in vaccines for poorer ones. These diseases are on the rise and their existence is a threat everywhere. If we do not do this, if we do not 
create vaccines that will protect people against malaria, TB, and AIDS. It is really perhaps only a matter of time before the global warming allows mosquitoes to move up the southern coast of the United States and bring uh, mosquito-borne illnesses. Uh, don't forget, we had malaria as high as Washington, D.C. in the early part of this century. Um, we had major problems in New Orleans, uh, which could emerge again. So we are vulnerable. Vulnerability decreases as populations at risk become immunized. Polio, a disease that has become rare in industrialized countries, is being eradicated in third world countries largely due to vaccinations. In 1988, 350,000 children worldwide were paralyzed by polio. In 2001, the number was 600. Ironically, vaccines have been so successful in the U.S., the public is focused on the few children who suffered adverse side effects from vaccinations and not the millions of children saved by them. Lawsuits and liability have driven many vaccine makers out of the business. What happened to polio? We have learned to prevent it. We do take vaccines for granted. We forgot what it was like to have childhood infectious diseases. We forgot what it was to have kids dying of tetanus and diphtheria and polio. What we do see in a world where kids don't die of those things, the inevitable and very, very small numbers of adverse effects that, like any medical treatment, in some very small percentage of people produce some degree of harm. And that's what we are most conscious of now, not having to see the tragedies of the diseases that the vaccines have eradicated. A vaccine works by tricking the body's immune system into responding as it would had it been invaded by the actual germs. Of course, our Hitchhiker's Guide has the specifics. When vaccines work, it's because they've set off an immune response without causing the disease. When someone is vaccinated, the white blood cells called T cells detect the vaccine and call in white B cells. B cells produce specific antibodies against the invader and remember how to make them. When the real disease invades at a later time, the immune system is ready for it. However, some disease organisms escape specific antibodies by either mutating rapidly or hiding in living cells. Genetic engineering is helping a new generation of vaccine makers create some novel approaches. This is a 3D computer-generated model of a herpes virus. Nearly everyone has been exposed to type 1 herpes, and about 20% of Americans have been exposed to type 2. These cells infected with herpes virus are swelling and dying as a virus replicates inside them. Herpes often comes into nerve cells and becomes a recurring infection. At Harvard Medical School, David Knipe has devised a herpes vaccine with a unique approach. The vaccine creates an infection to prevent an infection. What we've done with the vaccine is to genetically engineer a mutant virus that can infect just the first round of cells, and it's safe and it doesn't spread, and it doesn't hang around in the nerve cells like the wild-type virus. So we're using a limited infection to um, induce an immune response, and, and that will protect against um, real-life um, infections at a later time. Vaccinologists have also learned how to genetically modify a type of white blood cell called a killer T cell. They kill disease-infected cells in the body. By engineering them to detect very small genetic changes associated with various diseases, Killer T cells can be directed at the cells where those diseases are hiding out. This would create a vaccine of sorts for diseases that get into cells like TB or even cancer. The short-term hope for which there's now a lot of exciting data is that most cancers or many cancers have changes in their genes that are reflected in changes in their proteins. And if they are common to many different kinds of cancers, those changes, we can make vaccines against the altered proteins, hope to generate killer cells, and in this case, harness the ability of killer cells to kill our own cells, but our own cells altered by transformation into cancer cells. Imagine being able to prevent cancer with a vaccine instead of trying to cure it with chemotherapy, radiation, and radical surgery. 
Over the last hundred years, the average life expectancy in the U.S. went from 47 to 77 years old. Vaccines played a major role because they prevented diseases and saved lives, and they will in the future, provided people can go and get them. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board, consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.